Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee, the Exam Room Live, I should say. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube as we do our best to educate and inspire for the next 30 minutes. On tap today, plant-based protesters are walking in Memphis, demanding the closure of meat processing plants for safety workers and for our health. Their message is simple. Meat is not essential. We're going to get the latest on the situation when Dr. Neil Barnard joins us here on the exam room live. Dr. Barnard, can't wait to catch up with you, my friend. You bet. There's a lot to say, Chuck. And from the movie, The Game Changers, the man who looked father time in the eye and said, hey, I'm running an Ironman triathlon when I'm 60, and I don't care what it is you say. Dr. Jim Loomis is with us to answer your questions when we open up the doctor's mailbag. Dr. Loomis, looking forward to catching up with you as well, my friend. Always a pleasure, Chuck. And if you do have a question that you would like for the good doctors to answer, go ahead and post that in the comment section right now or the chat box. Do our best to get to as many as we possibly can before the end of the show. But before we get into anything else, let's get you caught up on what's happening in the world. Here are your health headlines for Friday, July 17th, 2020. The U.S. is setting new records for coronavirus cases. More than 75,000 new infections were reported Thursday, marking the 11th time in the last month that the single-day case record has fallen. But this is the first time that the number has surpassed 70,000. The death toll also climbing rapidly, with 10 states setting records over the past week, including Florida, which set a new high with 156 deaths on Thursday. The rates only expected to climb according to the nation's top infectious disease expert. Dr. Anthony Fauci says we could see as many as 100,000 cases per day if the current surge isn't brought under control. A new study finds minorities admitted to the hospital for COVID-19 are more likely to have severe chest infections. Researchers examined chest x-rays of more than 300 patients, finding non-whites had significantly higher rates of severe lung disease, subsequently putting them at higher risk for intubation and death. The study cites financial and language barriers, as well as higher rates of pre-existing medical conditions as potential factors. In other news, director Kevin Smith has opened a vegan version of a restaurant based on one of his iconic films. Movies, the fictitious burger joint that was featured in the 2006 cult classic Clerks 2, well, it's not so fictitious anymore. Smith brought the restaurant to life as a pop-up spot in L.A. that immerses fans in the full Clerks experience. Delivery is also available. Smith went vegan at the urging of his daughter Harley Quinn in 2018 after surviving a heart attack. Finally, in Memphis, protesters gathered outside City Hall with the message, close meatpacking plants in the volunteer state. It was the latest in a series of demonstrations by members of the Physicians Committee who are raising awareness that meat is not an essential part of the diet. Their message comes as officials in Washington, though, are stating otherwise, forcing slaughterhouses to continue operating despite outbreaks at hundreds of facilities nationwide. This is the latest in the series of protests, and it appears that the message is connecting as sales of plant-based products have been skyrocketing during the pandemic. I want to welcome Dr. Neil Barnard to the show. And Dr. Barnard, obviously their message is on point here, uh, not just for our own health, but the number of workers at these facilities who have been testing positive for COVID-19, it's just through the roof. Right. Uh, the message is really an important one. And, and just as you said, in fact, let's start there. I want to show you some figures uh, for, for uh, slaughterhouse workers. Um, can you see this? J July 16th. This was yesterday. Yeah, 20, sure do. Okay, 2020. Um, among slaughterhouse workers alone, I'm talking about the people hacking up the carcasses, we have had 35,387 cases of COVID-19 in just the United States. Uh, deaths, we are now up to 148 deaths. I remember when we had our protest at Smithfield, when was that? Maybe six, eight weeks ago. Uh, the numbers weren't even half that. They've just been going up and up and up and up. And then when you look at the inspectors, uh, the numbers are telling, uh, I'm talking about the USDA uh, inspectors who go in and they are the ones who are supposed to make sure that everything is hygienic. Uh, among them, we had 200 cases and five deaths, but that was as of about, I think the end of May. And it, uh, after that point, there's been a blackout. 
they won't even report the inspector deaths anymore. So uh, it's just an awful situation. Um, so it, obviously, if, if you think about why does this happen, you have people shoulder to shoulder. The uh, birds are, in the case of a uh, poultry slaughter plant or the pigs or the cows, are going by at a very rapid rate. And the concern is, is for the workers and also for the consumers, because if this person uh, works in a facility where even in the best of cases, we are estimating about one in 20 is actively infected with the virus. And the virus can be airborne. It can settle down on the carcass, gets wrapped up in plastic, and it goes to you. And then we pick it up, we touch it, we carry it home. Uh, and so these, this ends up on our kitchen counter, and then you slice uh, open a little plastic and the chicken juice falls out on the kitchen counter. And you have to remind yourself that chickens are not fruit. They don't have juice. The juice is the cooling water bath that the chicken's carcass went through. Um, so this is just last week from the Centers for Disease Control and OSHA, the Occupational Safe, Safety and Health uh, Administration, July 9th. Recent studies indicate that people who are not showing symptoms can spread the virus, and it may also be possible that a person can get COVID-19 by touching a surface or object, such as chicken, for example, that has the virus on it, and then touching their mouth or their nose or possibly their eyes. In other words, this is a respiratory virus. You think of it as being inhaled, but what if the chicken came in from a plant where people are infected with it as they are in all of the slaughterhouses, it comes to your home, and then you touch it, you touch your mouth, you know, you touch your eyes, or your child does that. This is the concern. Um, and it, it, lest we imagine that, uh, that we are the only ones concerned about this, you may remember uh, just a few weeks back, the Tyson's plant in Springdale, Arkansas, was boycotted by China. Uh, China was concerned that there was COVID there. There was COVID apparently on salmon from Norway, or, or at least the salmon cutting boards uh, in China with the salmon from Norway. Uh, pork from Germany. Uh, China owns Smithfield and they haven't wanted the products um, because of this concern about contamination. Now, uh, the, the, the poultry industry is fighting back. Uh, back in June, they said the following, not only does the virus not survive in food, but the poultry going to China is shipped at sub-zero temperatures, adding even more certainty that food safety should not be a concern. Well, do you believe that? And the short answer is no. Uh, back for many years, we have known that meat is actually a very good surface for keeping viruses alive. And this was known for common viruses like norovirus or hepatitis viruses and others. Um, but more recent studies have looked at, apart from just the fact that the meat is nice and moist and a great bed for viruses, the temperature is perfect. Now, at room temperature, on a copper surface, co the coronavirus, will be dead in about four hours. On a cardboard surface, lasts about a day. If it's plastic, stainless steel, maybe three days. And if it's glass or tile or Teflon, the virus can last about five days. However, how is meat uh, sold? Is it sold on copper or cardboard or plastic or glass? No, it's refrigerated. And when you refrigerate the virus, because it's wrapped up in a chicken carcass, it lasts for months and months and months. And if it's a frozen product, it's last indefinitely. So. Uh, this is the concern. Here is a, a, a report that looked at, does this act, this virus, the SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19, does it survive at refrigeration temperatures? And yes, uh, this report uh, just came out saying the virus is highly stable at four degrees centigrade. That is the actual recommended temperature for maintaining meat at, uh, at transport. Uh, but it's sensitive to heat. So once it's cooked, it's gone. The problem is on your kitchen counter, it's just come out of refrigeration, it's all alive. Okay, Americans eat a million animals every hour, mostly chickens. They are all coming from slaughterhouses where people are infected with COVID. Despite the best uh, efforts at all the slaughterhouses that we have looked at, um, there is no guarantee at all of, a, of an absence of it. In fact, uh, testing has confirmed that, as I said earlier, in the better facilities, about one in 20 workers has got the, the virus. So this is why working with LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, we called for a meat boycott. They're concerned about the workers. We are too. We're also concerned about consumer health, and it's time to 
get rid of these unhealthy products. You never needed to have uh, chicken or beef or the other things like this. You're, you're better off without them. And it used to be that to die from a meat related condition might take years, decades. Well, now it can take seven days. If it came into your house uh, and carrying, carrying the, the, the virus that causes COVID. So back to you, Chuck. Yeah, a couple of things that I want to follow up with you on. One, you were talking about uh, the concern of meat being on the, we've talked about shrimp and, and salmon in China. Yeah. And speaking to our correspondent who's actually in Beijing, Dr. Jia Zhu this week, he was telling me that they took that very seriously there and took extreme measures to make sure that that does not happen again, including banning imports from these countries where that shrimp and, and salmon came in from. They did. And China has banned this because they don't want to have this happen again. But that's but in the United States, we're seeing just a blind eye to it. Um, you're importing infected meat in, in all likelihood from Arkansas, North Carolina, Virginia, wherever there's a slaughterhouse. Um, and so the, here, here's the issue. Um, it's very hard to, for any particular case to nail down where did you get it from. There's the occasional case where a person knows I was at choir practice. I got communion in the crowded church. Those cases are pretty rare. In most cases, they are sporadic where we have no idea. And people are, are now thinking, could you have brought it in the door with your grocery delivery? Um, and with, with poultry products and meat products, they are the ones that are long-term refrigerated where the virus has the maximum chance of survival. Is it, is it fair to wonder if the virus then could also be on those packs of bag salad? Um, it's, it's theoretically possible anywhere. Uh, when, when we look at meat, the problem with it is, is partly the constituents of meat. You've got this high protein food um, that's nice and moist and it's great for viral survival and it's consistently kept at, at cold temperature. Uh, so when you pick up an apple or an orange in the store, it's been at room temperature for quite a longer, much longer period of time. So I think we should be hygienic about everything and concerned about everything, but there's nothing worse than a frozen or refrigerated meat product, because those are the temperatures that guarantee viability of the virus. And final point on this. So we've talked about the food itself. Uh, we've talked about the risk being posed to the workers and the meat inspectors. But one of the other things that you and I have talked about also is the increase, uh, increased rates of coronavirus that we've seen in communities that actually surround these meat processing facilities. So the workers are actually taking it with them out of the plant and then spreading it in the communities, it appears. It's really been that way for many decades um, with, with uh, animal related viruses uh, and, and bacteria where the people working with the animals will carry it home. Then the people that their families interact with will carry it to the community and it, it spreads from there. And, and back when all of this was starting, uh, South Dakota was the, was the poster child for, um, for uh, concern about this condition. More than half the cases of COVID-19 were in that one single building, and that was the Smithfield Slaughterhouse in Sioux Falls. So that's the epicenter of it, and we've got what, a couple of hundred facilities like that that are continuing to pump out the virus. So continue to wear masks, absolutely. Social distancing, absolutely. But we should also have distancing from the products that are coming from the slaughterhouses into homes. Uh, say no to it. Uh, there's, there's, there's absolutely no reason to be consuming these products or sharing them with your family or bringing them into your home at all. All right, let's move on now. It is time to open up the doctor's mailbag where we answer your health and nutrition related questions. Everything is fair game. Everything is on the table. All we need for you to do is to fill that doctor's mailbag with questions. So go ahead and post that in the comment section or the chat box. And for that, we are going to welcome in Dr. Jim Loomis. He's going to join Dr. Barnard. They're going to tag team and get you all kinds of educated when it comes to this stuff. Dr. Loomis, are you there? You're ready to rock and roll, my friend. I'm ready to go, ready to go. All right. First question comes to us from Tina. She wants to know, does it matter if cholesterol is high when the rest of the values are good, such as triglycerides, LDL, HDL? Well, so the reason we worry about cholesterol to start with is we know it's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And um, it's just one of many risk factors. So when we evaluate cholesterol, we, we look at all, you know, really across the board, we look at your blood pressure and whether or not you smoke and how much you exercise and uh, whether or not you've got type 2 diabetes or prediabetes or whatever, because all of those are, are uh, risk factors. Um, ideally, 
Um, there's a lot of controversy about this, but, but, but if you look at the epidemiologic data, at least, we know that the lower the cholesterol, the better. And probably the optimum total cholesterol is about 150. Um, and the optimum LDL or bad cholesterol is probably is less than 75, um, somewhere in there. Um, the other thing we look at is HDL, which is cholesterol, which is uh, your good cholesterol. There, there are some times where, where, so the higher the good cholesterol, the lower your risk for heart disease. And, and I, we do see patients who have high total cholesterol, a good LDL cholesterol, but the reason their LDL, their total cholesterol is high is because their good cholesterol is high, their HDL cholesterol is high. And, and um, in general, it's considered a HDL greater than 60 uh, provides a cardio, uh, it's cardioprotective. So especially in women, um, some women seem to be genetically predisposed to really high HDL levels, you know, 100 or something like that. And oftentimes you'll see an elevated total cholesterol along with the, 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 uh, uh, along with the elevated HDL, but a normal LDL. Now, one thing though, um, HDL's job is, is reverse cholesterol transport. So what it does, it goes out in the, in the blood vessels and scavenges up cholesterol and takes it back to the liver to be metabolized. And there are instances where if you go on a very low fat, high fiber, plant-based diet, and you naturally get your, your total cholesterol down, typically in the 150 range, LDL down 50, 60 range, your liver will actually stop making HDL. And this actually happened to me. In medical school, I was a marathon runner. Uh, my, my total cholesterol was a little high, you know, 210, somewhere in there. My, my LDL was a little borderline, you know, 110, 120. But my HDL was almost 80. When you fast forward, you know, 40 years or so, where I'm also marathon runner plus, my total cholesterol now is 150. My LDL is 50, but my HDL is only 38. And I exercise more now than I, I did then. And so that is something to be, uh, sometimes the cardiologists will get a little freaked out when they see this low HDL and they're gonna want, you know, they wanna put people on medicine and things like that, but, but uh, it's not a concern. All right. Next question, sticking with you, Dr. Loomis. Margaret on Facebook wants to know whether you can advise on vitamin A for vegans. What advice do you have? So um, in general, it's not. So in general, vitamin A is not a nutrient of concern in a vegan diet. Uh, vitamin A is a fat soluble diet. In fact, you have to be careful with vitamin A because you we store because it's fat soluble. We can store it, particularly in the liver. Interestingly enough, there are reported. So, for example, polar bear liver is incredibly high in vitamin A. And um, there's been reported cases um, of uh, Inuits in, in, um, who consume polar bear as part of their diet, uh, developing actually vitamin A toxicity um, from the overconsumption of, of polar bear liver. So, um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a supplement that you need to worry about. Um, if you're eating, a, you know, beta carotene is a form of vitamin A, you know, it's in green leafy, it's in a, a, the more pigmented like orange, like carrots and things like that. Um, so in general, it's not a nutrient of concern, A, and B, it's not something you really want to supplement with because your body can't, unlike some vitamins like vitamin C, which is water soluble, if you, once you've taken enough vitamin C, you just make your urine more expensive by excreting the rest. We can't do that with vitamin A because it gets stored in our bodies. Dr. Barnard, coming to you for this next one. And I love this name. This uh, question from 1215, a follow-up to what it was you and I were just talking about. Green Vegan Grandma wants to know, what about cheese and other dairy products? Are they also likely to be carriers for COVID? Great question. Um, well, first of all, uh, <laughs> whether it has COVID or not, cheese is the last thing that you want to bring in your house. And the reason for that is it's the number one source of saturated fat in the diet. And saturated fat is a contributor to cardiovascular disease. I'm talking about heart disease. And it's also appears to be a contributor to Alzheimer's disease. So whether it's got the viruses in addition, that's a problem. But you, you're thinking right. You're thinking about you've got a lot of people who might be preparing the cheese and the cheese tends to be refrigerated and that's an ideal temperature for carrying COVID-19. Um, I think you're right. Now, now ha having said that, the dairies do not seem to have the same issue that the slaughterhouses do with the huge numbers of known infections in the workers. So that's why we're especially concerned about the slaughterhouses. But cheese, no, nah, you don't want to have it in any case. 
All right, Dr. Loomis, we talked about vitamin A. Now let's talk about vitamin D. This one comes to us from Hannah on YouTube. I've been taking a vitamin D supplement since I live in a cloudy place and haven't been able to go outside very much because of the quarantine, but now I'm starting to feel a little nauseated. How often should I be taking this? Well, so um, vitamin D, as we've probably discussed before on this program, vitamin D, is an, we call it a vitamin, it really acts more like a hormone and it's made in response to, in, in our skin in response to the sun. And we need vitamin D for a variety of reasons. Probably most importantly, it helps, it helps increase calcium absorption in our diets, which is important for strong bones. There are, um, there are associations. It's not necessarily causation, but there are associations of low vitamin D with a variety of other uh, chronic conditions like depression and heart disease and some cancers. There seems to be an increased risk for COVID and, and both COVID risk and COVID severity with low vitamin D because it also plays a role in our immune system. Um, so in, in, in the practice here at BMC, we, we actually monitor, I typically will measure people's vitamin D level once a year or so. And if they're low, I supplement them appropriately. Um, it's not unreasonable, certainly, to, to take vitamin D, especially when you live in more northern climes where there's not enough sun to convert the, the vitamin D in your skin. Um, I usually recommend 2,000 IU, 1 to 2,000 IU of D3 once a day. Um, now, D3 comes in many forms, and um, uh, you want to be sure it's a, I think last week, Dr. Barnard talked about uh, vegan D3 versus, you know, some of it's uh, derived from lanolin, which comes from sheep, sheep's wool, actually. Uh, there are vegan forms of vitamin D3, which is what, what I take. Um, but, but it comes in many forms. Form. So you can actually get drops that you put under your tongue, which are just as effective, which sometimes will uh, will um, um, get rid of some of the nausea uh, that 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 can occur with with any kind of a vitamin or supplement. All right, Dr. Barnard, coming to you for this one. A lot of people have autoimmune disorders. This question comes to us from Anne on Facebook. She writes, I have a number of autoimmune disorders, including Sjogren's and fibromyalgia, Barrett's esophagus, arthritis. I've been eating a whole food plant-based diet for two and a half years, and I'm wondering when the pain will ease, if it will ease. Oh, Chen, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that you're dealing with all of these issues. It sounds really uh, rough, and I'm sure it's also been a diagnostic puzzle, and and you might not even be getting uh, very satisfactory answers from your doctor. So I'm really sorry to hear that you've been going through that. Um, at two and a half years, time's up. Um, so the diet changes that you've made, they're great. Going to a plant-based diet is the thing to do, uh, but that's more than enough time to have given it a good try to see if it'll help you. So if it hasn't helped, now would be a good time to take a fresh look at your diet. And this, here's, here's the sequence that we use in research studies, and you can also use it clinically is you start by eliminating all animal products. You may have done that, but if not, make sure there's no uh, meat, no eggs, but especially no dairy. Uh, when we look at the studies on rheumatoid arthritis and others, the dairy proteins, for whatever reason, seem to be probably the worst actor. And they're not only in a glass of milk, but they're often ingredients in other foods. So you'll want to read the labels for things like casein or sodium caseinate. That's milk protein. Um, and then if that hasn't knocked out the symptoms, let's go one step or, uh, further to what I call elimin an elimination diet. And there you eliminate all the big suspects of things that have caused sensitivities. That might include gluten, citrus fruits, wheat, other issues. Uh, and uh, these are foods that are normally well tolerated by folks, but you're gonna give yourself a few weeks to see if you don't get better. You eliminate all those foods, and if, you're, if your symptoms have settled down, then you bring them back in one at a time to see which one triggers the pain. And I've written about this. I've, I've written the, kind of the recipe for this in a book called The Cheese Trap that you might have seen, where in the end of the book, because, because I'm encouraging people to get away from cheese in part because of arthritis and other conditions, we show how to do an elimination diet. And let me encourage you to give it a try. All right. Uh, Dr. Loomis, final question is going to come to you. Uh, comes from 1223 on YouTube, Best Health Lifestyle. A person wants to know, what is the iodine daily recommendation and should we be supplementing with it? Yeah, so that's an interesting, it's a great question. And I think it is, iodine is one of the kind of overlooked nutrients of concern that, that, that um, uh, on a plant-based diet. It, it, and it's not because you're on a plant-based diet necessarily. Um, Iodine gets into our food through the soil um, in, in the foods that we grow. 
And over time, uh, in the, it, where most of our food is grown, the corn and the wheat in the Midwest, that soil has become depleted of iodine. And so in the, th in the 30s, uh, they started to notice that a lot of people were developing iodine deficiency and, and developing goiters, you know, thyroid disease. So the government started to subsidize, they started to subsidize the salt companies to add iodine to table salt. So if you're using table salt, like Morton's table salt, you really don't have to worry about iodine because there's, you're getting plenty of iodine just from the, from the, from the salt. It doesn't take very much, you know, half a teaspoon, uh, three quarters of a teaspoon is enough iodine. And by the way, you need 150 micrograms a day. That's, that's the goal. Most people, when they move toward a plant-based diet or a healthier diet, one of the things they eliminate is salt or they switch to, you know, pink Himalayan salt or sea salt. Now, that's still salt. From a health standpoint, really no benefit from, from sea salt versus table salt. Uh, it's just, we have this idea it's healthier, but, but you still need to be careful about, about your salt intake just in general. But when you're using these other products, um, these other forms of salt, uh, you're not getting the iodine that you need. And I've had some patients who actually came in with things like brain fog and just not feeling all, you know, couldn't concentrate. And we put them on an iodine supplement and, and, and they got better because we, iodine plays an important role in thyroid metabolism. We need iodine to convert, to make thyroid and then convert the T4 to the T3 in our tissue and things like that. So, um, there, so there's several ways you, if, and I'm not recommending table salt by any stretch of the imagination, but, but there are other sources of salt. So sea vegetables have a lot, have iodine. Um, so vegan sushi, for example. Um, some people will get dulce or nori flakes and you can put those on your, you can put those, you know, on in a salad or a soup. I think Bragg's actually makes a kelp shaker that you can shake onto your food. Um, what I do personally, I actually take a kelp supplement that has 150 micrograms of, of uh, iodine in it, um, um, just to be sure I'm getting enough of uh, iodine. So uh, you don't necessarily need to supplement the iodine. Uh, if you're diligent about using sea vegetables in your cooking um, and, and you, they, 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 again, they don't, you can use that and, and it doesn't make everything taste like seafood. Um, and, and a little bit goes a long way, uh, but, but it is an important nutrient to be concerned about. Thanks for asking that. All right. If we didn't get to your question, no worries. We save each and every one that comes in. So go ahead and keep on posting them. We will add them to our list and try to get you an answer on an upcoming show. You can also tweet them to us or send them to us on Instagram using the hashtag exam room podcast. Now, the final question that you may be asking is, I wish, where can I find a good doctor who understands nutrition like this? And the answer is via the wonders of telemedicine, the gang over at the Barnard Medical Center, including Dr. Jim Loomis, would be happy to meet with you via the wonders of telemedicine. You don't even have to leave the comfort of your own home, really putting a focus on treating the root cause of the problems and not just the symptoms. So if you're interested in making an appointment with one of the doctors or dietitians, head over to barnardmedical.org or call 202-527-7500 to schedule that appointment. You see the list of states and locations on your screen there where patients are being accepted, doing our best to add even more states in the very near future. Dr. Loomis, Dr. Barnard, I appreciate you guys taking some time to spend with us today. It's been really enlightening. There we are. There he is. Hi. <laughs> this just in to the list of states that we are now giving service to, Florida just came in. And that is right. Florida is now on the list. So if you are in Gainesville or, or Palm Beach or, or, or where, wherever it may be, we want to see you. That is fantastic news, especially right now. There are so many people that could use some help in the Sunshine State. So that is that is absolutely phenomenal news. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. BMC is now open in Florida, so we'd love to see it. Outstanding. All right, barnardmedical.org or 202-527-7500. Great news. What a way to end the week. Thanks, Dr. Barnard. Sure, thank you. All right. And finally, if you missed any of our shows this week, you can go back and watch them on demand at any time, both on Facebook and on YouTube. Full episode replays are there. And then also, if you head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify, Stitcher, really wherever shows are available, and look for the exam room podcast by the Physicians Committee. That's a great opportunity to relive a lot of the shows as well, including some exclusive 
interviews on there as well. I interviewed Dr. Jia Zhu. We talked about that earlier on the show today, all the way from Beijing. It's a great 20-minute interview all about the steps that China has been taking to take meat off of people's plates. And it, it was really interesting to hear him talk about how many people are becoming interested in plant-based diets over there because of the pandemic. And just as we're seeing sales trends in the US for plant-based foods shoot through the roof, they're seeing the exact same thing over in China. So really promising news over there. Also, revisit the conversation I had this week with Dr. Hanna Kaliova, where we looked at how eliminating meat and dairy from the diet can not just improve uh, the quality of your life, but add years to it as well. Talking about aging healthfully and the paper that she co-authored with Dr. Barnard and dietitian Susan Levin, really outlining the science behind why people who don't eat meat, don't consume dairy, actually age more healthfully than others. And Dr. Kaliova said four out of five of these deaths from the these preventable diseases, they are in fact preventable, really an extraordinary conversation. So head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify or Stitcher, wherever shows are available, hit that subscribe button and please leave a five-star rating. And if you want to be extra kind, leave a nice review as well. That's going to wrap things up for us this week. My thanks to the crew behind the scenes that makes all the magic happen. Our director, Donna Steele and producer, Laura Anderson. On behalf of Dr. Neil Barnard and Dr. Jim Loomis and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Have a phenomenal weekend. And until Monday, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.